Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. When we think of California, we think of beaches and palm trees, movie stars and Hollywood mansions. And yes, all of those things are California to the core. What we don't often remember is that California provides this entire country with the majority of our produce. I spent about four months living in Sacramento and Stockton last year, and it is a world away from the California you see on TV and in movies. Northern California is populated by hardworking people who live very modest lifestyles, scraping out a living in the oil, shipping, and farming industries. It is not an easy life or a glamorous life, but one of the perks is living in some of the most beautiful country on earth. When I say the farmland, the orchards, the rows and rows of crops stretch farther than you can see from any one place, I mean that literally. It is very green and very beautiful and very, very isolated in places. In fact, most farms are so large and so isolated that if you disappeared on one, no one would ever find you. These farms make perfect places for hiding secrets. For a man like Juan Corona, a serial killer, they made the perfect places for burying the bodies. This is the story of the machete killer. Let's get into it. February 7th, 1934. Juan Vallejo Corona is born in Jalisco, Mexico. He migrated illegally to the United States when he was about 15 years old to pick melons and carrots and strawberries in the fields of Imperial Valley. When he was 16, he moved to Sacramento with his half-brother, and then in 1953, they made their way to Yuba City to work on a local ranch. Juan Corona was a bit of an odd duck. He was somewhat solitary and he was known to be a little strange, just one of those people that you couldn't quite nail down. He was introduced to a family working on the ranch that wanted him to marry their daughter and he did just that. Gabriela Hermosilla and Juan Corona were married on October 24th, 1953 in Reno, Nevada, but within three months the marriage was in shambles and the couple divorced. Juan Corona spent most of his days in the field working. His life was not easy, but it was stable. Well, it seemed stable from the outside. But the people closest to Juan knew better. He was somber, he was withdrawn, and he was troubled. Juan was known to be a violent man. He had a terrible temper and was prone to fits of rage. He always had to be the most masculine guy in the room. He challenged other men to prove his machismo. He picked fights and people either didn't like him or they were afraid of him because he was so volatile. Juan was also known to spend time with openly gay men. Now, in 2022, we understand that his violent behavior and obsession with being uber-masculine are, you know, because he was dealing with self-loathing. He was angry about the fact that he had homosexual tendencies. He wanted to be around gay men, but he was also violent with gay men. Despite all of this, Juan was a reliable and responsible employee, and he was valued on the ranch by both his employer and his fellow farm workers. In December of 1955, there was a severe flood that washed through the Yuba Valley and it absolutely destroyed the area. Landowners forced their employees, migrant workers, to try and save their property, their farmland, by building up levees with sandbags as the rains fell. They did all they could, but it was not nearly enough. As the rain continued and the waters rose, the flood came. It tore through the valley with violent and rapid speed, and anyone in its path was killed. When the floodwaters receded, 100,000 acres of farmland were decimated, and 74 people were dead. People in the area were traumatized, but for Juan Corona, it was worse. Something happened to him because of this event. A switch was flipped. What people did not know is that Juan Corona had been living with undiagnosed paranoid schizophrenia for many years, and this event sent him spiraling out of control. He began acting erratically. He told the people around them that they were not real. He said they were ghosts of people who had been killed in the flood. He told a friend, everyone died in the flood and you are the spirits of the dead. 
Juan Corona had always been afraid of the water, but now he wouldn't go anywhere near it. He stopped bathing and his hygiene suffered. He seemed to be living in a place known only to him and he was often seen talking to people that weren't there. On January 17, 1956, Natividad, who was Juan Corona's brother, committed him to a mental hospital in Auburn, California. There, Juan was finally diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Over the next three months, he was given 23 shock treatments, which at the time were thought to almost completely cure schizophrenic episodes. Juan was released in the spring of 1959 and deported back to Mexico. Juan was not happy about being back in Mexico, and he immediately set about procuring his green card so he could enter the country legally, and in late 1959, he returned to the United States. He met and married a woman named Gloria Morena, and together the couple had four daughters. With his new legal status, Juan became a licensed contractor, and in 1962, he began hiring workers to staff local farms and ranches that he had affiliation with. It seemed he had really turned his life around, but sadly, he had not. March 1970. Juan Corona began to suffer the effects of schizophrenia once again. Juan's brother, Natividad, owned a restaurant called Natividad's Guadalajara Cafe. Now, Natividad was a gay man, and gay men were known to frequent his business. A customer went into the men's restroom and was shocked to find someone bleeding on the ground with a severe head injury. Jose Romero Rea had been attacked in the face and head with a machete and had nearly been scalped. Natividad called the police, and Rea was taken to the hospital for treatment. He had not seen his attacker, but Natividad and others were quite sure they knew who had committed the crime, Juan Corona. When Rea recovered, he filed a lawsuit against Natividad and the cafe, and he won a $250,000 judgment which Natividad could not pay. Natividad was forced to sell everything he owned in California, close his businesses, and then he basically fled back to Mexico. There was never enough evidence to proceed with criminal charges against Juan, and his brother paid the price. A few months later, a Japanese-American farmer named Goro Kajahiro was walking through his peach orchards, checking on the trees and ensuring all was well on his property. As he walked through the fields, he came upon a large, freshly dug hole. Kajihiro went to his employees and asked who dug this hole and why, but none of them knew anything about it. By the time Kajihiro got back to the spot where the hole had been dug to check on it again, it was nighttime and he was shocked to find the hole had been filled in. Who had come back to this freshly dug hole in the hours since Kajihiro had been there and filled it in? What exactly was going on here? He decided he wasn't going to touch this newly filled in spot and decided instead to call the sheriff. When the sheriff's department arrived, they agreed with Kajihiro this was strange and they were going to find out what was going on. They began to dig, to investigate, and it wasn't long before they hit something. They slowed down and began to dig a little more carefully and within minutes they found it. There in the fresh grave was the body of a man. He hadn't been dead long. He was dressed, but his pants were down, and as the police went through his pockets, they found gay literature and a matchbook from a local gay club. The man was later identified as Kenneth Whiteacre, and he was openly gay. At this particular point in time, the gay rights movement had just begun to gain some traction in nearby San Francisco. Gay men were living more openly than they ever had, but they were also being attacked and killed more frequently because of their more open lifestyles. It was not uncommon at the time in Northern California to hear about violence perpetrated against gay men because of this new gay rights movement. A lot of people were very threatened by this new movement for equality, and it was never a surprise to hear that a gay person had been attacked. Sad, but true. The authorities hypothesized that there were two killers. I'm not really sure why they came to that conclusion, but they kind of decided amongst themselves that two guys had been out drinking, had picked up this gay man for a sexual escapade, and then felt shame about it, didn't want the man to recognize them later on in town, and killed him to keep him quiet. No real examination was performed on the victim, but the police classified this as a sexually motivated crime simply because the man was gay, and that was that. 
About two months later, on May 24, 1970, farm workers driving a tractor at a ranch that was next to the peach orchard where Kenneth Whiteacre was found saw something out of place. They got down off the tractor and walked over to the spot and could very clearly see it was a large hole that had been dug and was now filled in. The dirt was fresh. They, of course, had heard about what happened on the ranch next door, and so they immediately called the sheriff. Again, the police arrived, again they agreed something was amiss, and again they began to dig. For a second time, they found the body of a man, and as they waited for the coroner to arrive, they began to look around. Not far from the dump site, they found a third spot of freshly mounded dirt. For a third time, they began to dig, and for a third time, they found a body. This time, as they carefully went through the dump site, they found a couple of pieces of paper. They were receipts from purchases made at a local meat market in Yuba City, and those purchases had been made on a credit account which required the purchaser to sign a receipt. The signature on the receipt? Juan Corona. Word began to spread. There were three dead men in three different graves, all in the fields where Juan Corona worked. They had all been killed the same way, hacked to death with a machete. When people heard about the found receipts displaying Juan Corona's signature, they came forward to the police and told them that Juan Corona had been in that area, in fact, in the very spot where the first body was found, on the night the body was found. People had seen Juan, they had seen his truck, and they knew that he had been there. The sheriff was playing things very cautiously. Remember, this was 1970. The term serial killer was not widely being used. Not only that, but think about everything else that was happening in this time frame. Charles Manson and his family of maniacs had just been arrested, and their trials were about to begin. It's always easy for me to remember the details of the Charles Manson timeline because it was really the first true crime case I became obsessed with and also because his trial started on the day I was born. <laughs> In this same time, the Zodiac Killer had just terrorized the San Francisco Bay Area in 1968 and 1969. Mac Ray Edwards had just been discovered. He's a little known serial killer that I'm always surprised more people don't know about. I would love to cover him here, but his crimes are very difficult to talk about on this platform. So maybe if I ever get a sponsor, I will cover him. He was vicious and horrible. Also, the Vietnam War was still going on. It was an era of massive upheaval and change, and I'm sure back then it felt like the world was going to hell. People always think the world is going to hell, right? Whenever I hear somebody say that, I laugh because that's been being said for hundreds of years, but anyway. The sheriff decided that even though he had these receipts with a name on them, that they were going to keep looking through the orchards before they went any further. He brought in extra manpower, and before long, the peach orchard and the acres on the neighboring farm were crawling with people who had been enlisted to help. It didn't take them long at all. Within a few days, they found six additional bodies in the peach orchard. All of the men had been hacked to death with a machete, and one had also been shot. Like the first three victims found, they either had their pants down around their ankles or they had no pants on at all. All of the men found in the graves were farm workers or drifters, and several of them had been seen asking Juan Corona for work. Some of the men had actually been seen in Juan Corona's pickup truck with him. So even though these men were migrants and some of them drifters and homeless, they had people who knew them and people who knew them well enough to recognize them and remember that yes, they had been with Juan Corona. May 26th, 1970. Sheriff's deputies arrest Juan Corona and begin an intensive search of his home, his office, and his car. They find an 18-inch machete many knives, a blood-stained club, a pistol with plenty of ammo, lots of shovels and digging equipment, and several additional receipts from the meat market, almost identical to the receipts found in the third grave along with the body of the third victim. They also found a blue notebook, it was a ledger style notebook, with 34 male names and dates, 34. Now they're stunned, but they're also intrigued. Has this man really killed 34 men? They start calling the ledger the murder book, and that gets leaked to the press, which of course only causes more sensation with the public. 
As authorities go to search Juan's truck, they find bloodstains inside his vehicle. And when they did, the sheriff was like, okay, we, we need to bring in some more help. He ordered the county plane and requested that it begin flying over the orchards and the farmland, taking infrared photos of the area, that was the technology they had back then, to see if they could see additional disturbances in the ground. Well, that was a smart move because within days, by June 4th, the aircraft investigation had uncovered 16 additional graves, bringing the total number of victims found to 25. Floodlights were brought in and the area was lit up so digging could continue day and night. The district attorney at the time was a man named Dave Teha. He went out to the scene and he said it was really hard to look at. The men were hacked up and covered with blood and mud. Each one of them had been stabbed through the heart horizontally like a bullfighter would do. Footage of the bodies laid out in the morgue made its way to the news and into the homes of people watching. They sat glued to their televisions as the anchor people talked about this uncovered killing field, which they began calling Graveyard Lane. The volunteers working on the digs started making bets on how many bodies would be found, and nobody even came close. The highest guess had been around 15, so people were in shock. They were mortified. 25 bodies. To this point in time, the Boston Strangler was about the worst killer they knew of, Albert DeSalvo, and he had only killed 13 that they knew of. 25 people's almost double that. People began calling from all over California and Mexico to see if someone they loved that had gone missing was one of the victims. Police report receiving over 1,500 inquiries, and those inquiries did help them identify most of the victims. In the end, 21 of the 25 men were identified, but four remain unidentified to this day. When I tell you that this case was an instant media sensation, it was wild. I found lots of old footage, some of it's raw footage, from local news cameramen back in the day. They stood outside the jail, they camped out, they waited for any chance to get a shot of this notorious madman who was being accused of killing so many people. Each time Juan Corona was brought into the courthouse or taken out of the courthouse, there was like this shark feeding frenzy, reporters crawling all over the place trying to capture an image of this maniac. I love this old footage. I especially love the singular female reporter there pushing and shoving in her red knee socks and her pigtails. <laughs> I bet you that was one tough broad to be the only woman in that world back then, right? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> this case was all people were talking about, especially in California. Juan Corona was appointed a public defender, an attorney named Roy Van de Heuvel, who quickly hired several psychiatrists to evaluate Juan, but then an attorney named Richard Hawk, who was a private attorney, stepped in and took over the case. Now, Richard agreed to represent Juan Corona free of charge in exchange for the literary and dramatic rights to Corona's life story. So Richard Hawk was all about the show. This attorney wanted the publicity and he loved the cameras. Mr. Hawk, is there any doubt in your mind that uh, Mr. Corona will be a free man after this trial? And if so, why do you believe so? There's no doubt in my mind at all that he will. I, uh, unless I don't you know, do as good a job as I ought to. I, I think it'd be a major victory for uh, Teja, if, uh, if he got one vote, if he could hang the jury 11 to 1, I think it'd be a major victory for him. Uh, I'd be very surprised if he has a vote at all. There may be a number of jurors at the end of the trial that want to discuss the evidence before they vote. That, that could well happen, but I don't, uh, based upon what he's, well, not what he's got, really, what he hasn't got, and, and, uh, and almost all his witnesses are going to be mine. All the experts that they originally hired are going to testify for one, in effect. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a negative thing. And, you know, based upon what they don't have is why he'll get acquitted. There's just no question about it in my mind at all.
es lo que piensa hacer sobre esta rehusada que le hicieron entrar para adentro? Darle a conocer al público. Quiero darle a conocer al público que nos están negando todos los derechos a nosotros, a toda la familia, porque no, el juez no, no nos habían, de, no, habían prohibido de haber entrado ahí al, al cuarto donde está llevándose al cabo la corte. Quiero que todo el público se dé cuenta de lo que está sucediendo. The thing that I see that I can do at this time is to inform the public that I have been refused the right to uh, go back into the courtroom and participate in the trial that is being had for Juan Corona. Now, you might think that because of all the evidence, the receipts found, the testimony from multiple people saying they had seen the victims with Juan Corona, that they had seen Juan Corona on the farmland as men were being buried, this would be enough to make everyone believe he was the killer, right? Wrong. A movement began declaring Juan Corona was innocent and that he was being railroaded by a racist system because he was Mexican. This surprised me. I mean, it didn't surprise me that people were saying someone could be targeted, you know, for racism in our system. That happens all the time. But it surprised me that this man had so much support. If you think about it, he's got a violent history. And on top of that, it was no longer a secret that he was, if not homosexual, at least bisexual. And back then, that pretty much guaranteed you weren't going to have any support. But for some reason, he did. This was the age of the hippie. This was the age where the death penalty had been taken off the table. So people were very compassionate at this point in time and they were wanting an overhaul of the justice system. And this man had a lot of support. My opinion is they don't have any evidence uh, in the case uh, really worth uh, any serious consideration at all. I'd be very surprised at the end of the trial that if they have, I'd be very surprised they got two votes. Uh, the prosecution got two votes. I expect at least 10 and uh, I, I think if they could hang the jury, it'd be a major victory for him. Any prejudice? Yeah, I think uh, they singled out a Mexican from Yuba City area for this. They think that, I think they felt that, um, that they haven't had a Mexican on stand and they could get away with it. They thought, I think that the authorities probably thought that um, the people were two and together to come out and support Juan Corona, but the people are behind Juan Corona. We're all one big family. Um, is innocent. Do you have any uh, any way? Of what, what do you base your opinion I, on? I base my opinion on the report from the uh, the expert of the state, Mr. Stottle Myers, who has already made the report to the state that none of the evidence that has thus far been submitted to the state uh, bears with Corona being guilty in any what way. But they're keeping this quiet. They're not making it public. We know this for a fact. In reality, they don't even have enough evidence to be holding him. He should be free, he should be out in the streets, but they won't let him go. How long do you believe this trial will last? I don't really know uh, because I don't, start off but the prosecution says they're going to call 250 witnesses and that's going to take six months in all likelihood it shouldn't last that long if they put on the evidence they got it last about three days but uh, typically uh, when prosecutors have very little they throw as much mud on the wall as they can hoping something will stick and that the jury will somehow get confused with the idea that they got a lot of witnesses and therefore they got a good case there were news stories and interviews with psychiatrists that aired on nightly TV programs because people were really quite fascinated with this man, this killer of other men. The experts at the time told the public that this was a modus operandi killer, a killer with a specific set of rules, and this was all very interesting to the public. They said he targeted farm workers between 40 and 65 years of age who were alone. Most of these men had abandoned their families, they had failed at life, and many of them had drinking problems. They were throwaway people that no one would miss, and this was attractive to Juan Corona. Juan was known to only hire green card carrying Mexican workers, Mexicans that were here legally. It was also known that he had a hatred for what he called winos. Not only did he refuse to hire these men that were commonly called tramps back then, he would often beat them in front of other people. He was a vicious and vile man, but later on he would seek those men out privately and drive them to the orchards to do what he wanted to do to them before killing them. 
He was very twisted and very evil. Yes, he was sick. Yes, he had a disease, but he was also a very mean and nasty person who had no empathy or care about anyone but himself. It was discovered that Corona would first club his victims, and the club that he used was later found in his home, like I mentioned. He would attack them with a machete, he would bind them, he would undress them and then assault them, and then he would bury them in one of these pre-dug holes. The sheriff actually stated to the media that he feels there were always several pre-dug holes on the farms Juan Corona worked on, just sitting there waiting for a body. The public fascination grew and everyone waited in anticipation for the trial. February 18, 1972. The trial finally begins. Richard Hawk quickly fired all of the psychiatrists that the public defender had retained to assist on the case. During the trial, Hawk made absolutely no mention of Juan Corona's mental disease, and he didn't bother to call a single witness to the stand. This man didn't care about what happened to Juan Corona. He didn't care about dutifully defending his client. He only cared about the publicity. The proceedings had been delayed twice, once because Juan Corona had two separate heart attacks, and then there was a delay because Juan was being tried with the death penalty on the table, and in the midst of his trial, like I said, California abolished the death penalty. So his trial had to be delayed while paperwork and motions were filed removing the death penalty as part of the case. But finally, the trial was completed, and on January 18, 1973, Juan Corona was found guilty and sentenced to 25 consecutive life terms for the 25 murders. His wife divorced him and he was sent off to rot in prison, but that isn't the end of the story. In 1978, Juan Corona got a new trial. His attorney was ruled incompetent and the courts agreed that he had not received an adequate defense. Juan's new attorney, a man named Terence Hallinan, had a new strategy. The defense was now going to blame everything, all of the murders, on Juan's brother, Natividad. At this point in time, Natividad was dead. He died shortly after returning to Mexico after the attack at his restaurant. So Juan had nothing to lose here. His brother couldn't defend himself. Terence Hallinan claimed that Natividad was a violent homosexual and that he was the actual killer. However, the prosecution had a witness that had done time with Juan Corona, and that man took the stand and testified that Juan Corona told him one night, yes, I did it, but I am a sick man, and a sick man can't be judged by the same standards as other men. Juan Corona's attorney tried to discredit this witness, but that bell had been rung. The other problem for the defense is that there was absolutely no evidence that Juan's brother Natividad was in California during the time of the murders, but there was evidence that he was in Mexico. So the strategy was not very successful. The trial lasted for seven months. Nobody can say that Terence Hallinan didn't try. Calling 50 witnesses takes a lot of time. But in the end, the jury returned a verdict of guilty and Juan Corona was sent back to prison. Not long after his return to prison, Juan Corona was attacked by other inmates and was stabbed in the face. He lost the sight in his right eye and was very seriously injured. Now, you would think that Juan Corona would have become notorious as the worst serial killer of that era with 25 victims, right? No, this was the 1970s, my friends, the era of the serial killer. Juan Corona only held the top spot for a couple of years after he was caught, because in 1973, our buddy, Dean Coral, the candy man that we talked about a couple of weeks back, he was caught and had 28 victims. Well, 28 known victims. Everyone thinks there's a lot more. So only in the 70s could a killer with 25 victims not hold the highest kill number for very long. It was a wild time, no doubt about that. Juan Corona sat in prison for decades, coming up for parole from time to time. At a parole hearing in 2016, Juan admitted that he killed some of the victims, but then he claimed it's because they were trespassing on the farm property. After many years of hard time, on March 4th, 2019, Juan Corona died in prison from natural causes at the age of 85. He spent the majority of his life locked away and mostly forgotten, 
only because he lived in an era where his sensational and horrifying crimes were not only matched, they were trumped by even more vicious and vile killers. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Like the video if you liked the video and subscribe to my channel if you want to support me. It helps a lot. Stay safe and be kind to each other and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.